everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and we've got another interview today. And this time we're going to look at something a little more serious, which is securing your uh, personal information online. And I'm sure we all know people who have been hacked by you know, hackers either intentionally or through malicious scripting or whatever. Uh, and in fact, in the United States, it's almost half the U.S. population has had some kind of personal information leaked out to people that really shouldn't have it. And I'm joined today by uh, Michael Kaiser, I'm gonna pull him up on our screen right here, uh, who's the executive director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And they're hosting a series of events across the country uh, where they're trying to get people to start thinking about two-factor authentication. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and about maybe some other ways that you can better protect yourself. So first of all, Michael, welcome uh, to the show. And uh, tell us a little bit about your organization and what you're doing with this tour that you're, you're on currently. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Happy to, to be chatting about this today. So the tour we're doing, uh, let me tell you a little about the National Cybersecurity Alliance. We are a true public-private partnership. We work with government. We work with industry. We work with a lot of our uh, NGO partners and civil society to help uh, promote education awareness for people staying safer and more secure online. You may know us from, you may not know us directly, but you may know some of our programs. For example, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month coming up in October as well as the Stop, Think, Connect campaign, which is the National Cybersecurity Education Awareness Campaign, and Data Privacy Day, which is something that we hold every January and other awareness activities. Excellent. So there's, there's, I guess there's quite a bit of, of security that people can do to really get themselves, you know, at least a little bit safer. I mean, we still have these issues of, you know, the grocery store hacks and all the other point of sale things. But I guess one of the biggest issues is that people tend to use the same password everywhere, right? So that when something is compromised, things can start to get a little awry, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the typical advice we always give is have long, strong, and unique passwords, right? Um, unfortunately, we give that advice and nobody takes it. And I, I don't really, I don't want to point the finger of blame here on anyone. I think the password system itself, the way the internet grew up with passwords as sort of being the core of security, was probably not the right way to go anyway from the very beginning. But that's what's grown up. And if you think about it, it's really only your password because most websites actually your logon is your email in probably 90% of people's cases. And then all you have between you and the bad guys is your password. And there's really, you know, people don't want to create these long complex passwords. It's very difficult, it's very difficult to remember them. It's very inconvenient. And as we know, even recently uh, in some of these bigger hacks, uh, passwords have been stolen. So sometimes even having a long, strong and unique password doesn't do you any good if your password's actually been stolen. So the whole model around passwords as account access um, has probably well outlived its, uh, its date of uh, expiration. So a two-factor system, I use this for personally for my uh, Google email, for my Dropbox, and there's probably now, most of the things that I use works with the Google Authenticator app on my phone. Um, can you step us through like how, uh, how this works for people? So I guess in the sense that you've, you've got your password, and then you've got something that's running on your phone that's always changing. So, you know, even if somebody had your password, they can't get in, right? So there's, a, there's two layers here. Yeah, so, the, the, you know, a factor is, is, is something that you have, something that you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so having m more than one, dual, two, multi, sometimes it's called multi-factor authentication, is adding a layer of security. So you gave a couple of great examples. So in some cases, you may log on to an account, let's say, you know, with two-step verification for Gmail or some of the other systems that are out there. You may log on in the traditional way, log on password, and then it sends an SMS code to your phone. That code is a one-time use code. You take that code off your phone, you put it into your, to your account before you access it, you log on, and you're into your account. Well, obviously, that's much, much harder to hack because someone actually has to physically have your phone in order to get that code. So it provides another way, another factor, but that's only one, one system. There are many different ways of, of uh, authenticating someone because that's what this is really about. So, you know, the, the finger swipe on an iPhone is a factor of authentication. That's a biometric factor, right? Um, there may be factors that you sometimes people might see um, uh, when they log on and so, uh, a service provider may say, You've never logged on to this computer before, right? Sometimes you see that on Facebook. That's kind of like a logon approval. Wait, this is a new computer. Are you sure, you know, you can, then they'll send you a message. Are you sure that this computer is one that you want to have accessing your account? So there are many different ways that it comes into fruition for consumers, but basically it's adding a layer of security. It's making, if, you know, to really think about it, it's adding a stronger front door lock to your account. Um, you know, it's like adding a deadbolt when you only had a regular key in the past. Right, and I, I've been 
evangelizing this for a long time. I, I did a video like stepping through, like this is how you do the, the Google Authenticator for your Gmail. And, you know, and it doesn't, it's not, I, I don't think it's hard, but it's not easy to set up. And I think what's happening is, is that so often people trade, and we hear this all the time, they trade convenience for security. And I, I, I can't get people interested in doing this. I mean, short of it being forced upon users, uh, it seems like it's a really, it, again, it's not hard, but it just, I just don't know why people don't do it. I mean, have you done any research as to why people are not adopting more secure means here? I mean, they get hacked and they almost seem like, oh, I just got hacked, sorry everybody, here's my new email address, and they move on. But that's not a good practice at all because it, it compromises my security because I may have written something to them, it's in their inbox, it gets accessed. What, what are some of the things that you're finding out there as to why people don't do it and, and what are some ways that we can get people more interested in doing it? Well, I think, you know, when we've asked people, and it's been a while since we've done any surveying directly on this topic, but when we've asked people, you know, would you consider doing this, you know, we kind of phrase it in a way that, uh, you know, helps them understand what it is. People say, yes, they would. Um, the issue right now is that it's mostly opt-in, right? So uh, I think there's a couple of reasons that people don't do it. One is I think they're not aware of it, and that's the reason we're having this tour, is to make more people aware that actually this is available to you on many of the ma major and most popular websites, so log on and use it. Um, and I think they don't know how to set it up, so that's one of the things we're also doing in this tour is we're showing people, for example, how easy it is to set up say, two-step verification in Google, right, so that you can have that on your phone and be ready to go. I think um, awareness about this is growing, and that's one of the things that I think is important. I think people haven't been quite aware that this is there, or they may even be using it and don't even know what it is. So when you go to your bank and they say, give us a picture of you, and then you log on and they say, show us the picture that you picked, that you gave us, that's, that's two-factor authentication, right? That is something that you know that the bad guys won't know. You know. Maybe they do know what you look like, but they don't know what picture you gave the bank. Maybe you gave a picture of you know, a mountain in Colorado and that's, your, you know, that's what you're using to authenticate yourself to the bank. So people may already be using it. I think the good news here though is it's gonna get easier and easier to use. I think we're gonna start seeing it much more prevalent. Um, I haven't seen a lot of places that require it yet, um, but I think eventually that probably will happen. I think there's a lot of good things happening um, under the hood here, uh, that uh, industry is working together to try and collaborate to establish standards so that you could say, um, you know, a, a form of authentication that you use on site A would also be acceptable to site B so that you would have some more, you know, ways of not having to have 500 different methods of authentication like we do with passwords. And so I think we'll see more of that as time goes on. That, that would be good because that right now I've got, I have two factor on everything. Um, right. So I think, you know, most of my services, again, are using the Google Authenticator app, which is a standard that, uh, that Google has kind of set, but also other, Microsoft supports it and others do as well. It's a great tool. I've got a video on that. People can watch on how to do that. But uh, Facebook and Twitter use their own systems right now. So, and they're used through their mobile app, so it's not completely difficult to get implemented, but they, they are different systems. So do you see some industry convergence here? I mean, it, it, you know, cause Twitter, Twitter's system is pretty nice, but it's very different uh, than it is from my other applications that I use. Yeah, what I think you're going to see is really around the standards, right? So what will happen is that behind the scenes, the industry and government, whoever participates in this, will get together and say, okay, here's the method that I use to authenticate, right? Here's the multi-factor I use, and here's I'm following an industry standard that we've all established together. And if you follow that, then I will accept your authentication on my site. So maybe, let's just take an easy example like a biometric, right? So I, I log in with a biometric, and... Um, I go to another site and they allow that biometric to be used in order to access their site because they trust the first site that I authenticated into, which will make life a lot easier for people. Um, you don't want to have, again, you know, 700 different things that you have to remember how to do, right, um, in order to be secure. And I think complexity can be the enemy of security sometimes. Absolutely, I think that's been the biggest thing, especially just how hard it is to type on these little phones to try to get those passwords in. I use something called LastPass, so whenever I've got a bank account to log into, I've got to pop into the LastPass app, grab the password, uh, put it in my clipboard, and switch back to the other app and go in. It's, it's, it's definitely in need of some reform, and hopefully we'll see yeah. more, more adoption of some real uh, good standards, because I, I really like the Google Authenticator method. It's been working really well for me. Um, knock on wood, haven't had any issues with 
uh, people have tried to get into my account, but they haven't been able to because even if they had my password, it wouldn't uh, get them in there. So tell me a bit more about this tour. So you're coming to Connecticut uh, Monday, and it's, I think, 9 to 11 a.m. here in Connecticut. There'll be other locations also, and you have a website, stopthinkconnect.org, people can go to. Uh, so if I go to one of these tour stops, what am I going to hear from, from folks there? Am I going to get some tutorials about how to do this? Yeah, you'll get you'll get a, a bunch of different things. You'll have some, uh, you know, some speakers from your uh, elected officials coming to talk about cybersecurity in general and multi-factor. We'll have an uh, we'll have a tutorial about actually how to sign up and you know give you an example of like a one site how you might sign up for two-factor authentication. And then we're gonna have a panel discussion. We really, you know, we're from Washington, uh, but we work with people all across the country. But we want people to know about the resources they actually have in Connecticut. So we'll have a panel with some folks from Connecticut who will be talking about what's going on in your own community in terms of staying safe and secure online, uh, and you know, a chance for people to meet other folks who are interested in the same topic. So we're really excited about the tour. Uh, it really is an opportunity for us to get out and talk to the public and try and make them alert and aware of the things that they can do to make themselves safer and more secure online. And is, your, is the NCSA, it's, it's very similar to NCSA Mosaic I used in the, in the early 90s, the old web browser, but uh, the National Cybersecurity Alliance, is that a uh, a group of industry partners, uh, like different uh, companies in the tech industry that have partnered up to create what you manage? Yeah, we were founded by industry, so um, we have many you know, major industry players who support us, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Bank of America, Visa, McAfee, Semantic, a lot of the names that you would know, Eastset, another AV company. Uh, so we have about you know, 15 companies that really support us at our core, but we work very closely with the Department of Homeland Security. We work very closely with other uh, nonprofits like uh, with the Better Business Bureau, with colleges, with universities. So we try to be kind of the in the middle party that helps harmonize and collectively create messaging that we can all use. You know, if we want to be a digital culture, um, we have to uh, adopt messaging that becomes part of the culture. That's what our Stop Think Connect campaign is. You know, we all know about Smokey Bear. We all know about Ticket or Click It, um, Click It or Ticket, I should say. And so we need to be the same in cyber. We need to be teaching people from a very young age, hey, stop, think, connect, right? Have, take security precautions. Think about the consequences of your actions and behaviors, and then connect and enjoy the internet. So we try to be the collective voice and then give voice to everybody else. And I think that's important. I, I really feel like when people say, I've been hacked, like they, they themselves, but, in, in, and again, as I said at the outset, it's more than that because your inbox has things that are private to me that I've shared with you that have now been given to you know, some overseas crime syndicate to, <laughs> to exploit. What are some things that, that people should do when they, they have their email compromised? Because I've seen, you know, I get the email, oh, I got hacked, I'm not stuck in London in a, in a, in a jail or something. Um, you, you know, what, what are some steps that people should take when they've been hacked uh, to let people know that there's an issue? We have laws around, at least in Connecticut, that if a major bank or somebody's compromised, they have to tell you know, their customers. Uh, what should an individual do if they are compromised? Well, I think individuals should you know, take some responsibility for alerting the people who may be impacted uh, by their email or say some other account being hacked, right? I mean, you, know, if, you, know, you wanna make sure that your friends, your family, your business contacts know hey, I had a problem, um, and now I'm rectifying it. So that alert, I think, is very important. Obviously, one of the first things we'd have people do um, is change a password <laughs> to your account. <laughs> right. That's the way they, you thought they got in. Uh, I would say implement two-factor authentication. There's no better time to do it than you know, right after an incident like that. But also, you know, once you've taken care of that, make sure that all your software is up to date. This is a very critical step. And you know, people sometimes forget that their mobile phone also uses software and all those apps and your phone operating system also needs to be kept up to date. So if you you know, have a little folder on your phone uh, in your apps you know, store that has a 27 by it, because those are all the apps that you have yet to update. <laughs> right. so either update those or delete the ones that you no longer use, right? Um, so we like to say keep a clean machine. That's kind of what we talk to people about, right? Try to do everything you can to protect it from infection, but also you know, keep it down to, to where you can manage it. Um, a lot of people download stuff, they use it once or twice, and they never use it again, and then they don't update it. So It's almost uh, better, good to have like a spring cleaning where you go through your phone. I do this on a regular basis. I'm not using that one anymore. I'm going to get rid of it. And yeah. One of the nice things about the Google Authenticator and the two-factor on the Google side is that I can go in and actually see what applications I've allowed to gain access to my account and revoke those things as, as time goes on. And Twitter does this as well. So there's a lot of really, you have a lot more control, I think, than you think. And it's just a matter of getting educated to to do that. But you know, I wanted to ask you before we, we close out here, the 
the password, I've been using passwords since I logged into BBSs when I was <laughs> you know, in the 80s on the modem and everything else. Um, and I'm still essentially, with the exception of the two-factor, accessing things with a username and password today. Are, are we going to see the end of passwords soon? There's certainly better ways to authenticate users, I would imagine, beyond just the password, now that we have all these new input devices, right? Yeah, I don't, you know, will we, will we see the total end of the password? I, I don't know, you know, and, and I think hopefully what we'll see in security is some, you know, stratification based on the need to protect certain kinds of information, right? Um, I think, though, you know, even with two-factor, you still may have a password that kicks off the process, like you're doing with Google Authenticator or with two-step verification with some others, that kick off the process for another layer of security. Um, I, I think that eventually, maybe they will go away. Eventually, you know, there'll be more device-driven authentication, right? So there might be something you connect to your computer that you touch or say something to or takes a picture of your face at any given moment that identifies you and it may become less onerous to access accounts once you're using those kinds of systems. Um, but there'll always be something, you know, something between you and, and, the, and your account, right, that has to, that you have to prove who you are to the account before you can do anything. So passwords will be around for a while, but eventually I think they'll go away. And I think the, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, as security gets more sophisticated, uh, I think we'll see much better systems um, and more convenience. And I think that's really been the issue with passwords at the end of the day. It's just not a very convenient system for people. Um, it's complicated, it's hard to remember, uh, and you need too many of them in order to really stay safe and secure. And I think people have just kind of voted with their feet on that one. You know, they, they, sure, they sure have. No, it's been, it's been kind of said, like, we get it. We know we're supposed to do it, but we're not going to do it. Right. You know, so we've got to change the system to meet their needs. We can't keep trying to force them uh, into a system that we think, you know, they should be doing. And that's one of the interesting things about some of these hacks that have taken place because you know, security researchers have taken those databases that have leaked out onto uh, various places and started doing an analysis of some of the passwords. And they're, I mean, they're like some of the pa most passwords people use. It's like password. It's not even. It's not even something like even remotely difficult because they're just so sick of having to remember everything, and it's uh, it's tough. And you know, I I read uh, Ghost in the Wire, which was a book by Kevin Mitnick, who was you know the world's first real you know amazingly talented hacker. And most of his hacking wasn't actually you know the computer-based uh, brute force kind of attacks. It was just uh, you know social engineering, which we're now seeing in a much more efficient manner of you know, these emails coming to you, this, you know, hey, click on this attachment and now you're, you know, you've, you've fallen for it and you've, all the security you've set up is now eroded because of this. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Is there any way we can, we can start prosecuting people overseas about this? How, how, what's happening on the international front to just stop some of this stuff from happening? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, you know, jurisdictional issues are quite complicated when yeah. you get, to, you know, a crime committed in, say, Connecticut and a potential perpetrator of that crime being, you know, across an ocean. I do think that law enforcement's doing a much better job than they were, you know, even five or six years ago around collaboration around those things. We've seen some arrests. We've seen uh, industry and law enforcement collaborating to take down things like botnets quite successfully. We've seen, for example, Microsoft and, 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 the, and the government working together to use the courts in a traditional way to go after people, right? Civil actions, other kinds of things. So, you know, it's really interesting issue because it, as much as the digital world has changed our individual lives, which it has tremendously. I mean, look at the things that, you know, you're obviously an incredibly savvy user. You use all this kind of technology all the time and, you're, and it's changed your life. It's redefined some other aspects of our lives as well, including law enforcement, including what do we mean by, you know, if you're a digital citizen, what does it mean to be victimized by someone in another country when there's no boundaries on the internet. They right, don't the jurisdictional issue isn't, there isn't one anymore because there is no jurisdiction that these people are, are essentially, you know, there's no stop, there's no customs agent <laughs> inspecting those, yeah. those packets when they come over here, right? The, industry, the, the, the internet does not conform to a traditional political boundary, right? So, um, I mean, that's not true in some places because some places they use the internet, you know, to try and repress people, right? right? Sure. So, you know, there's a lot of issues there. It's all another topic of conversation, right. but, yeah. but so that has to change. And I think that's changing now and I think the way people are working together to fight these things are changing like I've said those couple of examples in law enforcement or the way that um, information is being shared about like you know like we're having a crime having in this country and alerting the police in the country of origin like we have all the data about where this is coming from we know IP addresses we know you know some of the characters that might be doing this that's changing but people move slower than technology and those social changes that have to take place are, are, are always I think at least for the next near term going to lag um, the technology change, right? Every time the technology gets upgraded, 
something else new happens and we're a little slower to figure it all out and how to make our social systems work. And maybe that's maybe there's some checks and balances built in there that are good too. I'm not saying that's all bad because you know um, there are legitimate concerns and interests that have to be addressed uh, in order for people to work together better. Absolutely. In the meantime, you can just get that two-factor authentication on your phone and at least protect <laughs> yourself in the in the short term. So, well, Michael, thank you for joining us. Uh, the website is stopthinkconnect.org, and the tour is called Two Steps Ahead. So. Uh, if you can't find the information you need on the site, go to the tour uh, and they'll show you how to do it while you're there. And I think it's a, a great thing to be doing because if, if you're watching this video and you don't have two-factor authentication on, you need to have it on now. Like you needed it yesterday, but now is a good time to get started. So you have videos up there. There's a lot of good resources, right? So people can uh, do all that. So anything else you want to add before we uh, close it out? No, I just want to thank you very much and say, yeah, you know, everybody should go ahead, do the two step. And there's no time like the present to make yourself more safe and secure online. So let's do it. I am, I am with you there. And this is Lon Seib, and Thanks for watching.